my headliner is Gase is a fake. And the reason why I say he's a fake, because all single year we've been hearing how he's a quarterback guru and that he could figure this out, he could figure this offense out. And where have the Jets been all season? Now, the Jets are fighting with a lot of injury all season long. They've lost C.J. Mosley for the whole season. They lost Chris Herndon practically for the whole season. They've lost Avery Williamson for the whole season. This team was, everybody thought, was going to be somewhat of an 8-8, and 9-7 and team. Everybody thought that bringing Adam Gase in was going to help Sam Donald's development. And what we have seen so far is not that Sam Donald's development has gotten better. It's gotten worse. And I'm not blaming Sam, and I don't think Sam is a bad quarterback. But right now what we see is that the Jets have no idea how to run this offense. And the Jets are in a situation right now that in the offseason, they're going to be looking for so many positions offensively that they're not going to have enough money to spend it on the defense. What really makes me laugh is everybody talks about the Jets bringing in uh, an offensive guru. Let's look at the numbers right now for the New York Jets. This year, points-wise, they're averaging 17.4 points a game, which is 29th in a league. They're averaging 271.4 yards a game, which is 31st in the league. Pass yards averaging 195.8, which is 30th in the league. And rushing yards, 75.6, which is 31st in the league. I look at the Jets' offense. This is one of the worst offenses in all of football. They brought in Jamison Crowder. He's done nothing. They've had Chris Herndon. Everybody thought, oh, this is a breakout season. And I love Sam, and I love the confidence of Sam Darnold. But when you come out and say, when we get Chris Herndon in this lineup, we're going to be a completely different offensive team. We could be one of the best offenses in the league. What are you, on drugs? Seriously, what are you, on drugs? I've watched enough of this team in the last... 25 years that would make you want to croak. This team is a garbage team right now. It's poorly built. And now Joe Douglas, who I don't blame, has got his work cut out for him. Because right now, they have a lot of work to do offensively to build this team. And they're not going to have any money in the offseason to make moves defensively. They have no pass rusher. Their corners stink. They have two linebackers that can't stay on the field. Their young Quinton Williams has done nothing this year. I look at the Jets, they're in a lot of trouble. And I don't want to hear about Jamal Adams' contract. You might as well trade him because you're not winning next year either. Unless some crazy thing happens next year with this offensive line. This kid is running for dear life right now against this Baltimore Ravens team. I think right now when you look at this trade, does this make the Dodgers a powerhouse team? They were already a powerhouse team. Does Mookie Betts fit the Dodgers lineup? He doesn't. You're trading the top prospect in baseball, who's only 20 years old, and he's only going to get better. I think he hit 32 or 33 home runs in the minor leagues last year. I believe And a lot of people have come out and said that the Dodgers said that this kid was untouchable. Then it comes out over 24, 48 hours that they were going to move the kid, and they're moving him to the Red Sox. I think the Red Sox won this deal because they weren't keeping Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts wanted at least between $250 and $300 million. And that's what the Dodgers are going to have to oblige to him next year because he's going to want a lot of money. And the Dodgers right now have the highest salary in baseball. They're way over the salary cap in the luxury tax. And you bring in David Price. You have two high-profiled, high-priced guys. David Price, who's owed about $140 million left on that contract, who looks like he's aging right in front of our face. Mookie Betts, who's 28, going to be 29. And he's going to want a huge contract. He's one of the best players in baseball. One of the top five players in baseball. Five-tool player in baseball. Who can play two positions. Outfield and second base. He can actually play four positions. Eli Manning is one of the great giant quarterbacks that we've seen in any era. Because if you look at the great quarterbacks that they've had, there really was only two of them. Phil Simms and Eli Manning. If you look at Eli Manning's career number, he played 236 games. He should have played 236 (laughs) consecutive games in his career. Mm -hmm. He was 117 and 117, so he had a 500 record as a starting quarterback. With all those bad teams at the end of his career, he still had a 500 record. His completion percentage was 60.3, which is over 50%, which is not bad. He threw 57,023 yards in his career, averaged seven yards a throw, And 366 touchdowns to 244 interceptions, which is almost 100 more touchdowns to interceptions. That's a pretty good number. When you look at these numbers, some people would say it's a borderline 
Hall of Fame numbers. But what changes Eli Manning from not being a Hall of Famer to being a Hall of Famer was his career in the playoffs. If you look at Eli Manning's career in the playoffs, and I think he's been in the playoffs, I think, five times or six times in his career. He won two Super Bowls. So out of six years being in the playoffs, he won two Super Bowls. And he's one of only six players to win two Super Bowl MVPs. I'm looking at all the options the New York Mets have right now, and there really is none. There is no options right there right now for the New York Mets. And you wonder where the Mets are going to go here in this situation. There is less than a month left before pitchers and catchers in spring training, which kind of scares you right now because the Mets and the Red Sox are going to be looking for a manager. I I think I know where the Red Sox are going to go. They're going to go with the Tampa Bay organization because that's where the GM knows some of these guys. And I think the GM is going to bring somebody he knows that can take over this team and kind of push forward right now with all the the craziness that's going on with the organization with the Alex Gora firing. I, I look at the Mets. There really is nobody. That's why I say you bring in... Somebody of that magnitude, I think it could take over the locker room. I think the fans will be excited. Wally Backman is a fan favorite. Everybody wanted Wally Backman there for the last couple of years. When they hired Mickey Calloway, they were pissed off that Wally didn't get an interview. I think this is the big move for the Mets. You have a chance now to take over the tabloids, take over the newspapers right now. You bring Wally in. Now that you fire Beltran, you bring Wally Backman in. I think it will absolutely make the fans excited for the season. And that's what you want to do. You want to give the fans something to root for. And right now, with the whole Beltran thing, Brody looks like a joke. The Wilpons always look like a joke. And now you're thinking about where they're going to go with the manager. You might as well hire me and Speedy. I think we'll do better than some of the guys that are going to be available right now. It just, it's terrible right now where the Mets are at. And you were thinking that this year was going to be the year where they're going to push forward and maybe make a run in the playoffs. I don't know where they're at as an organization right now. I, I think it's great that they brought in Steve Cohen, who now is going to own... The majority of the team in five years where he's going to own 80% of the New York Mets. It's great for the Mets fans because you know he's going to spend money. He's not going to be the well ponds. He's not going to hold back on opening his pockets for big players. But where is this team? Where is this team going? I wrote a story about a giant bust. That's the headliner of my story. It's called A Giant Bust. And the reason why I call it a giant bust is because the New York football giants have the opportunity to sit down with Matt Rule, the guy that they wanted, a guy that has a tremendous amount of background right now over the years with the New York Giants. He was part of the Tom Coughlin regime in 2012. He was with the Giants for a couple of years, and then he moved on to Temple and Baylor, and now he's going to get an opportunity to coach the Carolina Panthers. And the story came out over the week about Matt Rule being the next head coach of the New York Giants. And you think of the New York Giants right now as a whole organization. Everybody thought it was a no-brainer that the Giants were going to hire Matt Rule. Now, I know a lot of the Giant fans were upset that Mike McCarthy joined the Cowboys. We all know the whole story behind the Mike McCarthy signing by the Dallas Cowboys. I understand that Jerry Jones sat down with Mike McCarthy, and he was his lead guy. And he was everybody's lead guy because he was the best available coach this offseason. But was he the best fit for the Cowboys? Was he the best fit for the New York Giants? That is the question. I believe he wasn't the best fit for the Giants, and I don't think he was the best fit for the Cowboys. Now, Matt Rule was the guy that the New York Giants wanted. Now, if they knew they wanted him, why did they wait so long to sit down with this guy? The Carolina Panthers flew on their private jet to Matt Rule's home to meet up with him and his family and sit down and negotiate a contract that he could not give up or pass up by the Carolina Panthers. Now, the Carolina Panthers have a better chance right now of succeeding and being a Super Bowl contender. The problem right now with the New York Giants is they didn't get their number one guy. They didn't get their number two guy. And I I don't even know if they had a number three guy. Because after we heard over the week that Matt Rule in the morning signed with the Carolina Panthers, three hours later, we hear from Adam Scheffner that it's a foregone conclusion that Joe Judge, yes, Joe Judge, the wide receiver coach of the New England Patriots, will be the next New York Giants head coach. Now you ask me, who is Joe Judge? What is Joe Judge as a head coach? And I don't want to hear about Saban and Belichick vouching for him. Because if it was Saban and Belichick, that would be another story. Joe Judge, he's a guy that I'm sorry, I don't know much about. I understand he's won three Super Bowls under the regime of Bill Belichick and McDaniels. I understand that a lot of people, including Julian Edelman has spoken high praise about this guy, that this is a guy that has helped him grow as a wide receiver in the league. The problem right now 
for the New York Giants is they hired a guy that has no coaching experience. They hired Pat Shermer. He had how many years as a, co- a head coach? Two, I think. Yeah, Two years close. before he took over for the New York Giants. You hired Ben McAdoo, who's had no coaching experience whatsoever. He was a quarterback coach and then an offensive coordinator for the New York Giants. And now you bring in a guy that has been under great coaches. No question. He's been under Nick Saban. He's been under Bill Belichick. But what experience could you possibly bring to the table when you're taking over a team that hasn't won since I, I, I don't even remember the last time they won. Four years ago, they made it to the playoffs. They were 11-5, and five, and they got knocked off by the Green Bay Packers when they were the favorites going into the game. Right now, where the Giants are sitting, it's not a good situation. And I don't care what Joe Judge says. We're not going to be slacking. We're going we're gonna to punch you in the mouth. Every coach is going to say that. Adam Gase said it with his floppy little eyes. What did Adam Gase do for the Jets this year? Oh, he gave them a 7-9 record. Is it a better record than they had last year? Yeah, against worse opponents. Joe Judge next year is going to have a harder schedule than Pat Shermer did this past year. Now, what are they going to do when you have a rookie coach with his back against the wall with a rookie quarterback? You have to bring in a defensive coordinator that has experience. I would definitely look at Rex Ryan. I would look at an offensive coordinator that has a tremendous, a North Turner. A tremendous amount of experience. You need to put good coaches on his staff to help him grow as a head coach. To depend on a rookie coach to go in a rookie season with the New York football Giants, being that it's in New York City, they didn't get their first guy, they didn't get their second guy, and we don't even know if they had their third or fourth guy on a list. It's bad news for the New York Giants fan, and it's bad news for the Giants organization. Here's the problem with the NBA. Ever since LeBron James, there was a lot of young high school players that have been successful coming out of high school and going into the NBA. And there were a lot of high school players that went into the NBA after high school and were not successful in the NBA. The players that were successful coming out of high school, Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, these are some of the top players of NBA history that came out of high school and went to the NBA. And LeBron James being the highest notable one that we've seen right now that's still in the NBA. Now, these kids come from very poor families. Most of them come from the mean streets of Chicago or New York or L.A. They come from all these different avenues and areas. Michigan, where there's crime, there's drugs, there's everything. When you come from a family that has nothing, that doesn't own anything, doesn't have a house, doesn't have a car, barely has a job. And to put food on the table, they have their 13 or 14-year-old kids going to work instead of concentrating on going to high school, getting out of high school with good grades so they can go get a degree or go play college sports. Some of these parents at a young age are pushing their kids to play basketball, baseball, hockey, football. Hockey being a very expensive sport, so let's take hockey out of the equation. I look at these kids, and I I feel bad for these kids because they can't make any money in college. They can't make money on signing autographs. They can't make any money on their jerseys. People are buying their jerseys. If you go play for Duke, R.J. Barrett, last year there were over fifteen to 20,000 jerseys sold in the Duke vicinity. R.J. Barrett made not one dollar off that. Is that fair to the player? I don't think so. I don't, I don't want to hear about these college educations because they're one-and-done players. They go to college to play one year of college because they have to, not because they want to. R.J. Barrett comes from a family that has money. And then you got guys like Zion Williamson that come from a family that has nothing. So you know Zion Williamson after his first year of college basketball when I know he wanted to win a national title. And if he had the opportunity, if he was making any kind of money playing college ball— He would have stayed and tried to win a national title the next year. 